Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, we do turn our eyes to you today. And now, Lord, we turn our eyes to your word. We pray that you'd speak to us through your word. We know that Hebrews tells us that your word is powerful. The word of God also tells us that it is powerful and effective. Unlike anything else, it's not just a book, but it is the holy and anointed word of God. We ask that you'd help us to understand. Holy Spirit, teach us as you promised you would. And now, Lord, we pray that you'd release the power of your written word into our lives and help us to apply it to our everyday situations. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Well, I'm excited to get into God's Word this morning. Uh, but before I do so, let me just uh, just share a few things. We had many requests on uh, on the bulletin that many people uh, like to take notes, and I was very blessed by that. So you'll now see on the inside part of your bulletin there is a little tear off that you can jot some notes down. I encourage you to do that. I've always been a note taker. Um, it helps me to remember things and study things again. And um, it's a small sliver of paper. You can stick it in your Bible wherever. Um, this morning is a, more of, a little bit more of a topical type sermon. Um, so we will not have a main scripture text. So uh, you can take notes if you'd like. Also, we made a few changes to our prayer list. And uh, what we are now going to do is, uh, and you'll see that instruction on the prayer list. We encourage you, please, on the back side of that of the bulletin tear off, there is a place for you to jot down some prayer requests. If that's not enough, you can write some stuff on the inside. Um, if you could get that into the church office, uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, we usually publish that uh, finally printed out Thursday or Friday at the very latest. So, um, if you can get that information to us, we would appreciate that. A prayer list, a prayer request will be listed on the bulletin or in the uh, on the prayer list for four weeks, four consecutive weeks. And then they'll come off uh, of the prayer list. Um, if there is a more sensitive need, um, maybe, maybe there's a need that you just want the pastors to be aware of. You can jot that down and just mark on there, you know, this is a sensitive area. You know, please don't publish this. Um, we, we realize we have to be more and more careful about uh, what we publish in our bulletin as far as prayer requests are concerned. And, um, and the details of that. And we'll be as detailed as we can as long as we have permission to do so. Um, and then also there are some, some needs. We also have our, uh, our shut-ins listed in there. Um, and again, be, you know, be very careful where you lay that. I, I, I kind of um, I, I wondered about that. I thought to myself, I don't, I don't want necessarily that list to get out into wrong, the wrong hands. And people all of a sudden discover this list of shut-ins. And you know, they're just the prime target for somebody to take advantage of them or break it. I mean, you have to think that way these days. So... You know, keep that to yourself, um, and uh, the prayer lists are intended for that reason. Uh, there's some other needs on there that are ongoing needs, and people have asked us if you'd, you know, keep that on there for a little bit longer. So those are those couple of changes, and, um, and uh, if you, uh, again, if you have any prayer needs, please just fill out, use that tear off in the bulletin. So this morning I'm going to begin, it's a four-part series and it's, un it's entitled, Unleashing God's Power. Unleashing God's Power. What I'm going to do is, uh, these, these four messages, I'm going to preach one on Sunday morning and one on Sunday night. And I've done that before in the past. And then afterwards, I thought, man, I should preach that one again on Sunday morning. But you're just going to have to come out on Sunday night. This morning, we are talking about unleashing the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Unleashing the power into our lives. Tonight we're going to be talking about unleashing the power in the name of Jesus into our lives, into our situations, and we're going to put it into practice tonight. Next Sunday morning, I'm excited about this message, I'm excited about all of them, but we are going to be talking about unleashing the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know there's a lot of churches that really keep the Holy Spirit at a very short leash? They do, one amen to that, so you've been to a few of those churches. But there are many, and we can never take it for granted. The Holy Spirit wants to do so much more in our lives and in our church life. Um, and we're going to be, we're, we've been discussing that on Wednesday evening. We've been doing a series 
entitled When God's Spirit Moves. It is a DVD-based series from Jim Simbler, the pastor of Brooklyn Tab. And uh, we're going to be uh, digging into uh, the next week. Uh, this week coming up, Wednesday night, we have a couple more weeks left. We invite you to come out for them. Uh, even if you've missed the previous ones, it's all right. You can come out. You won't be lost. And then next Sunday evening, and we're going to put that into practice as well, we are going to be talking about unleashing the power of praise and worship. Whether we realize it or not, there is power in our praise and worship in this place. There are, there's power, thank you for that, amen. There is power in praise and worship. There's power in our words. Whether good or bad, you could sit and mope and complain. There's power in that. Believe me, folks. You know, there's an old saying, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. It's not even so much that it needs the oil, but... There is power in what we say, and we have to be very aware of that. And so in our praise and worship, it's not, all, it's not about hype. It's not about the dynamics of the music, although I'm very thankful. We have wonderful uh, musicians, great worship leaders, but there is more power in what we are singing, in the words that we are singing, and it's so very important. Whether there are an old hymn or a newer chorus, there is power in the words that we sing together. And we're going to talk about that next Sunday night. But this morning, we are beginning this series, Unleashing God's Power. Unleashing God's Power. It's time to see God's power unleashed. Let me preface it by this. It is not God who has leashed up His power. It's not God who is limiting his power, although scripture does show us on a couple of occasions that God removed his presence from certain places. We see that Jesus tried to minister in his hometown. He wasn't accepted there, so what did Jesus do? The Bible tells us that he wiped the dust from his feet and left there, and he was really discouraged by the fact that he, could not, he was limited in what he could do in his hometown. So there is some theological understanding there that, that God may limit what he's going to do if the people aren't receptive to it. But I realize that it is usually us that leashes up God's power in our own lives and in our church life. So we're going to be uh, doing this series, Unleashing God's Power this morning, Unleashing the Power of the Blood. Uh, there is a live event that's also listed in the bulletin. You can take a look at that. Um, as well, and the points there and the scripture texts are there as well. The word unleashed means this release from a leash or restraint. You might say, duh, Pastor John, that makes common sense. But here, here it goes on to sell, tells us this unleash also means to cause to be released or become unrestrained. That's what I want to focus on unrestraining God's power in our lives and today we are looking at the blood of Jesus Christ and yes I preached on it intentionally because it's communion Sunday there is power in the blood of Jesus Christ come on now I'm gonna say that again and you're gonna say amen like you all believe it all right there is power in the blood of Jesus Christ some of you sound like you believe it some of you, it's still kind of out there. I'm not quite sure. There is power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, you're getting it. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> uh, I want to say thank you to those of you. Uh, last week, as we concluded our deeper series, I shared with you about getting deeper into God's Word, and I encourage you, challenge our church to a 30-day Bible reading challenge. You might say, you might be here and say, well, you know what, I, I, I do read my Bible every single day. You are in the minority. I mean, if you were to look at the percentages of Christians who pick up their Bible or some type of device and actually read Scripture every day, you would be shocked, you would be alarmed. There are some Christians and probably a large majority of Christians that only pick up their Bible if they pick up their Bible when they're going to church. And that's it. But I want to challenge you to get into God's Word because that's going to help us to unleash God's power into our lives because we're going to discover things in God's Word and realize how powerful God's Word is when we begin to study it for ourselves. I, I don't care necessarily what you've always been taught or, or, or what you've learned growing up. We need to get into God's Word new and fresh without any of our biases, without any traditions, and say, God, you speak to me through your Word. Holy Spirit, you make things clear to me because I will do what your Word tells me to do. I'll do that. We've got to get to that place. 
So I want to encourage you to do that. I, I encourage people to, you know, with all the negativity going on, to just flood Facebook or the, the real world with Scripture. I mean, they're, they're, if you start putting Scripture out places, leaving Scripture at the restaurant, you know, make sure you leave a good tip when you do that, especially if you leave a card for our church, inviting them, make sure you leave a decent tip. Um, that's what, come on, that, that, was, that was some, that, that was instruction, but I was meant to be a little funny too. We got to have a good testimony, right? <laughs> so leave a good tip. They depend on it. We got a lot of college students around here, and they depend on that. So let's work on that. Uh, but the 30-day Bible reading challenge, it's just something. I'll tell you what, um, this week I've been so blessed to see so many people, all different age groups, posting Scripture like crazy. And I've talked to about six people this morning that said, Pastor John, they were like incredible testimonies of what God did through that. Just real quick, Monday morning I posted a scripture. There was a former, uh, an individual that we had pastored several years ago. Uh, this individual did a lot of stuff in the church, was always there, uh, always willing to volunteer for things. I mean, just constantly. And this person said they read that scripture that I posted Monday morning. They were so weary, they were ready to talk to the pastor and say, I've got to let something go, which I shared with them. It may be a little wise to, you know, cut back if your schedule is that busy. But they were like ready to give up. And they said, you have no idea. I, I, I got on Facebook before even getting into my devotions, which I shouldn't have done, which you shouldn't do. One amen. Some of you are like, what's Facebook? <laughs> Don't even discover it. <laughs> it's a waste of time, oftentimes. But it just consumes you. But you, it can be anything else. You could get involved in whatever. Oh, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to start cleaning. I got to do. And you can get involved in stuff, and before you know it, half your day is gone, and you, and you didn't spend any time in God's presence or in the Word. And so this person said, Pastor John, you have no idea. Wednesday came up and I was reading uh, a scripture in, in the book of Peter uh, uh, where Peter says that, that we are uh, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation. And that was our youth group when we, when we first started youth pastoring in New York back in 96. And uh, God led me to that scripture. We changed the name of the youth group. I wanted the students to understand that they were a chosen generation. But every generation is chosen of God to be a royal priesthood. And so that was our name. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to post that scripture and I'm going to tag as many students as I can find. My wife can attest to this because I'm like, can help me think of some more students that I, I just can't remember them. And I, one by one, started to tag those those students, many of them, uh, you know, are college graduates, are married, have, you know, their career now, and they said, one of them private messaged me and said, Pastor John, you have no idea how much that ministered to me. He said, I got, I got up to go to work, I got to the office, I, I checked, you know, I, I checked, I also posted on the Version Bible app, I checked that, we're friends there, so, you know, I don't know if he was on Facebook or if he was on that, and the, and the scripture really ministered to him, and he said, it reminded me of the things that you preached at us all those years ago of the special calling that God has on our life. And uh, this young man is, is a very successful businessman in, in New York City, and uh, it just reminded him once again of who he truly was in Christ because that's really what it comes down to. Not so much what we've accomplished in this life, but who we are. And so this morning, we wanna, I want to talk about three things uh, when it comes to unleashing the power of the blood of Jesus Christ into our life. Three things, three things I want to look at in Scripture that, that were achieved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And this may just be a, a, a reiteration to you. This may be an enlightenment to you. I, I'm not really sure, but apply it wherever it may apply. First of all, number one, one thing that the blood of Jesus Christ does is cleansing. It cleanses us from our sins. You might be sitting here and saying, Pastor John, that's so obvious. But you know what? It's not obvious to the everyday Christian. The, the everyday Christian still feels like they are, they are marked by everything that has ever happened to them. That their lives are so stained by their past, by what they've done, maybe even by their apathy when it comes to God. You have no idea how many Christians are still, they still feel so stained by sin. But the reality is, is that when God forgives us of our sins, He casts them away from us as far as the east is from the west. I mean, if you started circling, heading west, circling the globe, you're just going to keep on going and you're going to make never-ending circles. That's how far our sin has been cast away. There are so many Christians where they feel like the stain of sin is still there. Now, 
um, stains sometimes are hard to get out of things, clothing. You can just ask my wife. I am, I am very stain prone. In fact, here's something that I, that I keep with me. I used to have it, keep it in my little briefcase bag, but I have it in my office. It is a tied to go stick. You have no idea how many times. And this is exactly what I do. I, I'm eating lunch, whatever, and I just... <laughs> my tie. This is why I wear colorful ties, because they hide stains. But if you got up close, you'd think, oh my goodness, look at my pastor's ties. So, stain to go. There are certain stains that are so difficult to get out uh, but some people, they're just amazing how they can get it out. There's a book called How to Clean Practically Anything. I mean, it goes through stains. Somebody said, yes, you have that book? You've used it? I mean, there are all different kinds of stains. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, I'm not going to go down through the list of them, but I looked at the list of them, and most of them I've had on me somehow, except for the last one, beer. I've never spilled beer on myself because I've, 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 I've never had beer um, in, uh, well, okay, I have to admit, I may have tried it when I was much, much younger, but I've never drank. I've never been drunk. I've never, you know, my, I may have gotten in a little bit of trouble when I was a teenager, but that was just minuscule kind of things, and, and my parents ha handled it very swiftly and corrected things. Uh, but I tell you what, stains are impossible to get out. But what this book does, it, it gives you a detailed method on how to get stains out. I have another illustration. Now, they've come out with products nowadays. Uh, can, can you say thank God for cleaning wipes? <laughs> cleaning wipes? <laughs> We should have bought stock in the company years ago. Cleaning wipes are fantastic, but they're a no-brainer. You just pop them out, they clean anything. This may be bad, Pastor Carl, but sometimes I'll, I'll pop them out and I'll wring them out really good and I'll clean whatever, my iPad, my computer. It's probably bad, I know it. <laughs> but I, I mean, it cleans just about anything. Uh, you know, the pets, you know, our, our cat once in a while spits up a hairball. I pick it up and I clean it with a cleaning wipe. I, you know, I never read the instructions, but I'm sure it says on there it's not safe. So, you know, these cleaning bottles right here. All right, I stole this from, from Darlene's cart back there. All right, so this is Clorox cleanup cleaner and bleach. And obviously it has bleach, so this probably, I shouldn't squirt it on my shirt right there to clean it off or else, you know, I'll, I'll ruin my favorite shirt. Um, so on here, there is all kinds of stuff. And what ends up happening is people are like, you know what, I, first of all, if I took my glasses off, I can't read a thing. All right, so I put it on. I barely can make out. And then I have to find where it's written in English as I move up here. And then, and then you know, all I see is, you know, warning, you know, don't drink it. Okay. All right, that's pretty obvious. You know, and it's got all this stuff in here. And you just get so lost in the instructions. What do you, what do you end up doing? How many of you actually sit and read the whole bottle? Anybody in the room? You don't read it. And that's what happens when it comes to God's Word. There's so much, and there's so much out there in the world, we don't even bother to really discover what God's Word says about our stains and what the remedy is to those stains. We just go on, you know, uh, we, we have, you know, I've got favorite, you know, things, and finally my wife has to retire them. She'll have to say, honey, you can't wear it. I've joked around before, I could very easily be Mr. Rogers. If I have a favorite pair of jeans, I could, I could buy five pairs of them, and, and that's it. If I like a certain shirt, I'll buy it in three colors, and that's it. That's all I need. I'm good to go. Um, I have these, these old, the, they're, you ever see the, like the Nike sandals? You know, those expensive ones. I bought the Walmart pair of gray sandals, and I wear them everywhere to the point where my daughters would say, Dad, you wearing those sandals? <laughs> I said, you just be quiet. You're lucky I don't have socks on, okay, with these sandals. <laughs> I'll walk you right up to the school with my socks and sandals. One more word out of you. But how to, how to clean practically anything. You see, the universe's most powerful stain remover is the blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, even in, its, even in the, the physical concept of it, nobody is going to go and clean a stain using blood. Because what does blood do? Stain more. But it's a concept that the world cannot understand, but the church needs to realize it again to be able to unleash the power of, of the blood of Jesus Christ into our lives. There are Christians sitting in this room where you feel so stained, so marked, so broken, 
that God wants to do a work in you today. He wants you to realize how powerful the blood of Jesus Christ is. You don't believe me? Let's look at a couple of scriptures. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It tells us this, Revelation 1, beginning in verse 5, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Everybody say blood. Blood. And has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve with God. Everybody say with God. Not for God, but with God. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. That statement sums it all up for all eternity. It is by the blood of Jesus Christ that we are cleansed of our sins and our stains and they're gone. And we become the kingdom of God. We become God's kingdom because of that. You see, in the New Testament church, we can't fully understand the whole concept of it, especially in a Christianized nation, if you still want to call it that. Especially in that place. You go to other places in the world where they've never heard this concept before and you begin to tell them when Jesus Christ comes into your life and changes you, he makes you a new creation. You become a part of the kingdom of God. A kingdom that will last forever. You don't think that changes people's lives? People who live in dirt poor situations. People who are threatened, their lives are threatened every single day. But we are so comfortable we forget the power of it. Now, there are two kinds of sins that the Bible speaks about. You might say, well, you know, pastor, sin is sin. And I understand that's theologically correct, but let me just break it down to you. There are different categories of sins, okay? You have to understand that. But let me tell you, it's it's by the same precious blood of Jesus Christ that covers all of those sins, all right? Number one, you see the, the sins of commission, These are doing something that we know we shouldn't do. If God's word tells us we shouldn't do something, like commit sexual immorality, and we do it, that is a sin of commission. You you know that it's wrong, but you do it anyway. And then there are the sins of omission. Sins that we commit by not doing something. By not doing something. We know we ought to do something and we don't. Failing to pray. Failing to read God's word regularly. Failing to tithe and be a part of the body of Christ. Did you hear me? fail you to do those things God has commanded us to do there's some people that sometimes if they're disgruntled or they're they're upset about things they think they're going to get somebody back by withholding their tithe gets who the only person is that's going to be hurt in that situation that individual God has called us to be a part of the body not just to be a Christian he has called us to be the church not just to go to church but to be the church it goes on to tell us this, uh, uh, other, other ways of, of sins of omission, failing to provide for your family, failing to provide for other people that, that are in need. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't want to just focus on those things. I want to talk about two specific things, two categories, if you would, of sin. First of all, there is the sin that we know of. There's the sin that we just, we know that we've sinned. We know we've made these mistakes. We come to the point where we know we need to confess this sin before God and in order to take care of it. The Bible tells us this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful. Everybody say faithful and just. And will forgive us. Everybody say, will forgive us. And purify us from all unrighteousness. That's what the Bible says concerning sin. So if we know we've sinned, and we confess our sin, and we repent of our sin, the Bible tells us that God will forgive us. Okay, I want you to understand that. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses sin. But there are a lot of people... And that they say, you know, because to confess sin means to admit it, to take responsibility for it, to uh, no excuses, no ifs, no buts about it. I've sinned, I've made a mistake. But there's a lot of people who make excuses for their sin. But here's one thing the blood of Jesus will never do. The blood of Jesus will cleanse us of our sin, but it doesn't cleanse our excuses. We've got to come bare before God. 
Imagine if salvation worked this way. So, you know, you come to God and you say, God, I, I give you my life. And God says to me, well, you know what? I forgive you of all of your past sins. And then the person says, well, you know, God, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That's such a great relief. But then God says, however, if you sin again, you're going to go straight to hell. Imagine if salvation worked that way. God says, I'll forgive you of everything in the past, but if you sin again, that's it. You're done. That's it. You're going to go straight to hell. You might as well just go off the, the deep end. Now that deals with the sin that we are aware of, the sin that we have confessed before God. But what about the stuff we're unaware of? Because you can make an attempt to say, all right, I know, I mean, the stakes are high. God says that if I do this one more time, if I sin in this way one more time, I'm going straight to hell. I mean, that sets the stakes very high, doesn't it? I mean, if you know that going into it, you have the assurance of eternal life if you never sin again. How many of you think that we'll try a little bit harder? I, I think I would. I don't know about you, me and two other people. But that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Because what about the sins that we commit that we're unaware of? The things that happen that we're unaware of? You can't confess something if you're not aware of it. Now, we all know, common sense tells us that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us will ever live a perfect life. You may look around the room and you may think so-and-so is a perfect Christian. I mean, they have it all together. They never make a mistake. They never get mad. They never say anything bad. They're here at church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. They even come to Sunday school at what time? Thank you. That's an advertisement for Sunday school. They even show up for prayer meetings when they're called. They are, you know, there's nobody perfect, but they have got to be as close as it is to perfect. There's no such person. All right, you need to understand that. I read this this week as I was studying, sin is like an iceberg. Back in 1956, they discovered the largest iceberg I, I, I failed to write down how big it was. It, I, I, didn't, I had no cons. I've never seen an iceberg, so I didn't know what, what big is or it sounded big. But you know what they discover about icebergs? Can anybody tell me before I even get to it? There's more under the water than there is on top of the water. That's what happened to the Titanic. They were going a little too fast and they realized there's more under the water. It's the same way with sin. There's more behind the scenes than we fail to recognize. So what do we do with those sins? The Bible tells us this, 1 John 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Everybody say, all sin. If we walk in the light... So what that means is if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you confess your sins before God. That when you receive Jesus Christ, as long as you continue to walk in the light, what does that mean? You continue to serve the Lord. You continue to grow in your walk with the Lord. You read God's Word. You study God's Word. You pray. You join together. You realize you're a part of something bigger. You're a part of the body of Christ. You join your life together with somebody else, and and we walk through life together as the church. As long as you do that, that the blood of Jesus Christ covers and purifies us from our sin. But if you're made aware of something, if the Holy Spirit reveals something to you, you better make it right before the Lord. Number two is this. The first thing that that the blood of Jesus Christ does is it cleanses. Everybody say cleanses. I want you to know that if you confess before the Lord, your sins are forgiven. We're the only ones that hold ourselves back. Forget the scars. Forget the stuff in the past. Learn from it, move forward, God's forgiven you, okay? Secondly is this, 
We have access into God's presence. You might say, well, that's common sense. Anybody who's been around the church realizes, you know, the Bible says that we can go directly into presence, into the presence of God. But you would be shocked to, to find how many Christians still believe that that's only for maybe the pastor or other church leaders. They have very limited access into the presence of God. You'd be shocked. There may be some of you in this room today that think that other people may have greater access than you do. Now I brought another illustration with, with me this morning. It is the keys to the kingdom, not the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of Mount Morris Gospel Tabernacle, believe it or not. This can be used as a weapon as well. So if anybody comes into my office, I don't carry a gun. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I, <laughs> uh, I don't carry any kind of weapon, really, um, at all, except if I have these keys let me tell you, a whack upside the head might cut you open a little bit. So I, I don't know, it's either that or my Bible, okay? And I've been preaching from a very small Bible lately. So I don't know how much damage that's going to do other than quoting the Word of God. Um, but these keys right here, now if you wanted to get into certain areas of the church, you probably couldn't. We try to be very vigil about locking things up. I know it upset people, you know, it's upset people early on, but we realize we have so many different entrances that once service time starts, that we need to we have our security go and lock those entrances. We don't want anybody just walking into the junior children's church downstairs or walking in a back door and wandering around or anything like that. So we lock those entrances. We have a main entrance and we have security out there. They know what to do if somebody might happen to walk into the place. But let me tell you, there are keys to every. I got keys to the church vans here. Uh, I, I've got I, some of these keys. I have no idea what they're for. Um, uh, I don't have a key to the safe. I gave that to you know off, that duty off. I've never wanted that. Uh, but but other other leaders in the church have that. Uh, I got some other keys. This is these are keys to the newer property that we have up up here on the hill. I mean, there's a whole lot of keys. I I have the keys to the Mount Morris Gospel Tabernacle Kingdom right here. But it's, it's one thing to have the keys. It's another thing to use them to access things. Here's the thing. We have, whether you realize it or not, it may not you may not have a keychain that size right there. But let me tell you, you have the keys to the kingdom of God. Jesus took those keys and he has given you all authority. You have every right to access God's presence. Let me tell you, growing up as a young kid, growing up Catholic, I was under the understanding that it was only the priest, only the, uh, the father of the church that could access the very presence of God. But let me tell you something, I've, I've found out something quite different, that each and every one of us have access into God's presence. And you have to understand that it's the blood of Jesus Christ who opened up the access for us. Hebrews 4.16 tells us this, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Everybody say confidence. You need to be cleansed to have the confidence that you're clean before God in order to access the presence of God. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy. Everybody say mercy. That's what we receive when we get into God's presence. Because going back to our sin situation... We confess our sins, but there's sins that we commit that we're unaware of. You know what would happen to a high priest if he went into the Holy of Holies and there was sin in his life? Anybody tell me? He died. Good thing that doesn't happen in the New Testament. Because I'm going to go out on a limb. I'd say we all be dead by now. Because that's the reality of it. But... We can go in. Why? Because of Christ's mercy. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we have access into the kingdom of God. I was thinking about Esther uh, when Mordecai encouraged her to go into uh, the king's presence even though uh, it was her husband. He, uh, she responded to him. She knew she couldn't do that. She said, the king has but one law when it comes to accessing the throne room. If you came into the inner court of the king uninvited, what happened to you? You were killed. That's what happened to you. But she didn't realize 
at the time that God was going to show mercy in that situation, but ordinarily, that's what would have happened. But here's the thing. God is no ordinary king. He's no ordinary leader, person. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe. What he says goes. And he's promised now, because of the blood of Jesus, which we need to unleash into our life and realize we have this opportunity. So how was God approached in the Old Testament? Because in order to understand this now in the New Testament, we have to understand what it was like in the New Testament. I ask you to just bear with me just for a few more minutes. I want to share these few scriptures with you. In Exodus 33, 20, it tells us this, but he said, you cannot see my face. God's saying this, for no one will see my face and live. In the Old Testament, nobody could see God and live. That's how limited the access was to God's presence. If that's not enough for you, nobody was allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant, which represent, represented the presence of, the God, of God. In fact, the, the high priest had to put a pole through. They couldn't actually touch the actual Ark. They had to carry it with a device so that they would never come in contact with it. When the Ark of the Covenant was, uh, was being transported to Jerusalem and it began to tip over, Yuza reached out his hand to steady it, and what happened? Immediately he was struck dead. That's how limited the access to God's presence was. When the Ark of the Covenant finally reached its resting place in the holy, of, the holy place of the temple, no one could go in to see it except for the high priest, and that was only once a year. Tell me that God's presence had very limited access. In order to understand how, how freely we're able to go into God's presence, we have to understand how limited it was in the past. The Bible tells us this in Mark chapter 15, and you may be familiar with this verse, verses 37 and 38, when Jesus died on the cross, it says, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That was the curtain that limited the access into God's presence. So what does that signify? Because of what Jesus did, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we have access into God's presence. We need to unleash that into our lives, but we can't treat it with contempt. That's, that's what we oftentimes do. We treat the, the fact that we can go into God's presence anytime we want with such contempt. What do we do? We don't do it. But how powerful it is. God wants to unleash that power into our lives. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20 tells us this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. Thirdly today, third thing I want to remind us again that the blood of Jesus Christ does is it provides redemption. Now listen, redemption is different than cleansing. Redemption goes far beyond cleansing. You can clean something, but it's going to get stained again. But when we tap into the, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, we become redeemed. And you know what the redeemed is going to do? Revelation chapter, I forget the chapter, Revelation tells us they are going to sing a new song. It's the song of the redeemed. It's the song of the redeemed that we're going to sing. And we need to understand what this word redeemed means. Ephesians 1.7 tells us in him, we have redemption through the blood. We have redemption through the blood. This is how redemption worked in the Old Testament. I'm going to be concluding here very shortly, I promise you. In, in the law of Moses in Exodus chapter 21, basically uh, a man is, is drugged. This is just a hypo hypothetical situation. A man is drugged before the judge and the accuser says, this, man, this man's ox gored my son to death. And, and so the judge replies, well, that's fairly simple. Uh, really, the, the law of redemption is this. The ox needs to be destroyed. Then the accuser says, but that's not it, judge. I've warned this individual about their ox before. And, and they've done nothing about it. And then another man stands up, stands up and says, I've done the same thing. And then another one, I've told him that that ox was dangerous and he did nothing about it. Then the judge says this, 
Well, the law of redemption tells us this then. Not only does the ox get put to death, but the man gets stoned to death as well. The man knowing the outcome of things, he knows the law of redemption. He says, you know what, wait, wait a second, judge, before we rush to judgment here, I have money. I'm willing to pay. I'll pay whatever money is needed in order to buy my redemption. And so an arrangement is worked out with that man, and probably, you know how other people, you know, when a lawsuit ensues, other people, jo- you know, join in on the fun as well. And so the other people are like, well, I want him too. I need a cut of that. And so an arrangement is made, and the man's redemption is bought by his own money. I was going to bring a bag of money as an illustration, but I didn't have one. <laughs> I do have a little envelope with mad cash that I, st- that I try to store away for a rainy day, but it, it gets dipped into. I, just the last month, it was like, Dad, I need money for this. Dad, I need money. It was like, you know, all these hands. And then I looked up and Dennis had a handout. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding, man. <laughs> then I looked up and there was Rachel and Megan and I'm like, hand them No, wait a minute. You're not my kids. Give me that back. No, I'm kidding. You know how that is, right? <laughs> But I didn't, I didn't have the money to, 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 to bring that illustration with you. But that's how the law of redemption worked. There had to be compensation paid. But let me tell you, you may, even, the, even the wealthiest person on the planet, even Bill Gates, doesn't have enough money to pay off God for the remission of his sins. I'm sorry to tell you that. There's not, a, there's not enough money in the world. So his life was forfeited. He bought it back. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 tells us this. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. That's the problem with it. Sin continues to happen over and over and over again. Romans 6 tells us that we are slaves to the power of sin until we come to Christ. Romans 8, 15 says that we are in bondage and had a spirit of bondage. And then also, Acts chapter 20 Paul's, uh, Paul's challenge to pastors and overseers. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock that the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. You see, the whole world is enslaved to sin, except the blood of Jesus paid full price to redeem it all. Come on, give God praise today. There are people that their ransom has been paid and they don't know about it. And I believe it's because there are many Christians that don't realize their own ransom has been paid. So how can they tell somebody else about the ransom that was paid for their life? Imagine a, a bank robber coming and, and, and uh, coming and, and ga- you know, robbing the bank and gathering hostages. And, 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 uh, and the bank robber says, well, you know, he has all of his demands and, and um, he, you know, he's not going to meet, you know, he's not going to let them go until his demands are met, until he gets out of there unharmed and that sort of thing. And so one person walks through the door. You may be that person and you walk through the door and you say, you know what, I'm here to let all of these people go. Take me. I mean, you see it in the movies sometimes. Times. Take me, spare them, take me. Obviously, they're a little bit more valuable, or else they probably would have took you in the first place. And you may be a person of great wealth, you may be able to do a lot, but obviously the bank robber is going to say, you know what, you're only worth one person. Why am I going to release these 12 hostages and just take you? That's going to, you know, that's going to more than level the playing field for, you know, for the law enforcement here. I want you to understand this, because it's It's the principle of value. And I'm going to ask the worship team if you'd come back. It's the principle of value. It is in Scripture, one life for one life. You've heard the saying, an eye for an eye, that sort of thing. But here's where that principle comes from. It's uh, found in Exodus chapter uh, 21. Exodus 21, verses 22 through 25 speaks specifically about this. If people are fighting and they hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. That's where that principle comes from. That when there is a redemption that needs to be paid, it is one life for another life. You're you following me so far? Because that principle applies in the world as well. 
Life for a life. But let's go back to our illustration of this bank robber. Now just suppose for a moment that, that the president, I was going to say the president of the United States, but how about Bill Gates walks through the door because he's you know, one of the wealthiest individuals. Or the president walks through the door and says, I'm willing to give my life for all of these individuals if you let them go. And I know we don't negotiate with terrorists, but let's just say that might happen. Let's suppose for a moment. Now... The robber might say, well, I got a little bit more leverage here because these guys are worth a whole lot more than that other guy who walked through the door trying to give his own life, you know, for all of these people. So then, then there might be a little bit more leverage. But let me tell you again, this principle still applies. This principle of one for one still carries over into the spiritual realm. In fact, if Jesus was all human, he would only be able to give his life for one person. Only one person, and we'd all be back to where we began, we started. But as sinless as Jesus was, he was more than just human. He was the Son of God. And God said that I am willing to give my Son for the redemption of everyone. Now we need to understand the principle of redemption to understand that God gave his very own Son to redeem us all. We need to unleash the power of the blood of Jesus Christ into our lives and realize what God has done for us. Would you stand? Hallelujah. Lord, speak to our hearts. Help us to realize that your blood has bought and paid for us, released us from bondage, that your blood, Lord Jesus, has incredible power. And Lord, I believe that there are some in this place today that need to unleash the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. There are some here today that need their sins cleansed, need to be forgiven. There are some maybe here today that need to receive you as their Lord and Savior to realize that we are totally forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. That we can put our faith and our trust in the blood of Jesus Christ because it will never fail. It never loses its power. And Lord, help us to realize that we have instant access into your presence today because we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have been bought back from the enemy's hands by the blood of Jesus Christ. God, I pray over the next couple of weeks that you would unleash your power into our lives, that we would allow the leashes to be broken, that we would have no more reserve, that we would say, God, we want all of your power that you are able to give us. You've promised it to us power to change our lives, power to heal us, power to empower us to be your witness. We want it all, oh God. We want our worship services to go beyond just singing songs and coming in and going out, but we want to experience the presence of God when we open our voice. We pray, oh God, we petition heaven that you would send your spirit on this place, oh God. That, Lord, we'd worship you with reckless abandon, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Unleash your power into our lives. Help us again this week to discover it in your word as we commit ourselves once again for another week of digging deeper into your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're going to sing. The worship team is going to lead us. If you need prayer today for anything, Our leaders are going to come around you and we're going to pray. And I believe that God will unleash the power of the blood of Jesus Christ into your life and over your situation because the blood of Jesus Christ still heals today. As the worship team leads us, there will not be a formal dismissal. You can feel free to go. We invite you to come out tonight. We're going to unpack this a little bit more. Unleashing the name of Jesus Christ in our life and in our situation. Again, if you need prayer, 
Please come.